Or, hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If I could ask you to please find a seat, uh, we'd like to get the uh, the briefing started this morning. So, first of all, uh, thank you for coming. Welcome to the U.S. Energy Association. Welcome to Washington D.C. Karibu Sana. It's good to have you here, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrew Palmatier. I'm a program director with the U.S. Energy Association and responsible for the U.S. East, US East Africa Geothermal Partnership, which is a Power Africa funded program that seeks to promote geothermal energy development in East Africa. So uh, today we have a very special program. We've been spending the last week out on the West Coast in California and Nevada um, on, a, on a mission with KenGen to explore uh, how, strategies for sustainability of geothermal reservoirs. Uh, as many of you know, the Okaria Geothermal Reservoir is a very important part of the Kenyan energy mix and uh, looking forward into the next 20 and 30 years, the priority of the Kenyan government and, the, uh, and KenGen to ensure that that resource remains sustainable, generating power for the people. And so I'm very, uh, very honored this morning to welcome two uh, excellent guests to our, uh, to our offices. Uh, first, the Cabinet Secretary for the Minister of Ener Ministry of Energy, Charles Kater. Uh, and second, the Managing Director and CEO of KenGen, Ms. Rebecca Miano. Uh, today, they're going to have a, a conversation about the uh, current state of the Kenyan energy sector, plans for development, the priorities of the, ministries, of the ministry moving forward. And so without any further ado, I'd just like to introduce um, the Cabinet Secretary and Mrs. Miano and welcome you to the new championship city in Washington, D.C. So uh, please join me up front. Thank you. My name is Charles, the CS Minister of Energy from Kenya, and uh, Rebecca Miano is the CEO of Kenyan, which is uh, uh, one of the largest companies generating uh, power generation. With that team, we have uh, uh, Cairo in the board of uh, Kenyan. Abel is a director of uh, geothermal Devel uh, development. Uh, Mafisi is a geologist in the ministry. William also is an accountant in the ministry. And we have a Jack. That is the team. And then we have a, a person from for, uh, for a, our mission here in Washington. That is the team. And then, uh, do you belong to the team? Or? <laughs> I don't know. I'm part of the two Venn diagrams. Yes, uh, from far Africa, but we work together. So that is the team we come from Kenya, and essentially why we are here is that we are focused on the sustainability of our geothermal fields. And that's where we, uh, we travel all the way to California, uh, geysers and fossil fields. Uh, because uh, uh, Rebecca will talk more on the field, uh, particularly about our field. I will give you uh, the overall picture of where we are and where we are heading uh, as a country. Uh, I think you all know where Kenya is. It's a small, <coughs> tiny country <laughs> in Africa. Uh, but it's a gateway uh, to Africa. And um, uh, energy uh, is, uh, plays a critical role in our development agenda. Currently, we are focused on uh, four pillars. That is manufacturing, uh, affordable housing, and universal health care and food security. Those are the four big pillars which we have focused as a country, whereby energy cuts across uh, the all four sectors. Uh, therefore, as a country, uh, with the new leadership from 2013, uh, if you can see where we've come from, our installed capacity was about 1,700 megawatts. 
currently as we speak is about 2400 megawatts. Our focus in the next four years, uh, we are focusing for 5000 megawatts. Uh, and that means we really have to do a lot. Our generation mix is largely renewables, uh, hydro and uh, geo. So out of the 24, uh, I can say about 90%, 80% is on renewables. So hydro is about 800 megawatts, geo is about 600 megawatts, uh, largely run by Kenjen, and we have Ormat doing 150 megawatts. We have a bit of wind run by Kenjen, 25 megawatts, and then we still run some thermal power plants, about 700 megawatts across the, <coughs> the, 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 the country. But we are working on there are a lot of power projects which are on stream. Uh, the, the other second item, which is uh, the, the, our assessed electricity, you can see from 2013, so it's about 27%, translating to about 22 uh, million households. Uh, currently, as it stands, about 6.6 million households, uh, translating to about 74%. Uh, we are working towards universal assess of, uh, of electricity uh, by the year 2022. Uh, that 100% of our domestic household should be connected. So right now, we have an ambitious uh, program uh, supported by uh, the Kenya government itself, World Bank, African Development Bank, French Development Agencies. Uh, all of them are putting resources so that we can achieve our universal access to electricity. So we are doing a lot of, uh, a lot of ambitious in terms of connectivity, and we call it the last mile. Uh, that is uh, the distribution network. Uh, the second, uh, the third item, of course, is a um, is a is a tra transmission uh, lines which we are doing uh, across the country. You've seen we are, by 2013 we are running the high voltage lines which are running from uh, 33, 66, 132, 220, uh, 400 kb. We are doing the biggest one, 500. That is going to interconnect from Ethiopia connecting to Kenya now. Uh, you can see we are, we are doing about 4,000 right now. Our aim is by the year 2022, we should have done about four, about 10,000 kilometers of those lines. So it's, it's a lot of work and Kenya plays a very, very vital role in terms of the uh, interconnect to the east, to the, to the north and to the south. We are doing the, the biggest line, as I have said, from Ethiopia. Uh, currently, uh, we are by next year it should be done. That is 500 line, and <coughs> another one to connecting Uganda, 400 Uganda Tororo, which goes all the way to uh, Kigali and connecting to DRC. Okay, so we, our aim is to make sure that we work all the way to connecting to the West Africa, either through the DRC and the Central Republic of Africa. We are doing one uh, right uh, right now again connecting to. Uh, Tanzania, uh, connecting to Zambia, going to connect to the Southern Papua. Therefore, um, as we stand, we'll play a very vital role in terms of the interconnect, uh, in terms of the high, uh, transmission line and creating the highways. Therefore, uh, that is the, 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 the where we are. <clears throat> we have a lot of plans uh, going forward to achieve our target. What, do we need to do? I mean, you've seen where we are and where we are going. We, we have a program. In terms of generation, uh, we are really focused on geothermal. That is priority number one. Number two, we are also trying to do um, solar and wind. By September, we will be commissioning the 300 and the largest uh, solar wind power, wind power in, in Africa. That is 310 megawatts. Uh, we should be commissioning to the grid uh, by September this year. And we are, there are a lot of projects which are there. We are also doing the first solar uh, power plant, 55 megawatts, should come to the grid by uh, September. And this is also a field which is also open. We are changing our policy from the feed-in uh, tariff policy because the tariff is a bit, a bit high. We want to transit uh, to in a junction. And then hopefully in the next about one month, we should be announcing uh, that transition so that we can open it up uh, currently uh, in 
terms of the solar and wind. And uh, of course, um, we are looking forward to do, doing an LNG project. Uh, the cost of vehicle of about 700 megawatts, so that is equivalent to the thermal power plants if you are running uh, uh, again. That is on stream, we are working on it. And in terms of, um, as I have said, what you are doing uh, is uh, a lot of work. In terms of how do we evacuate this power, because I think that is more crucial, is um, we have done a lot of power, for how do we evacuate? We are looking at doing um, a PPP, whaling tariff, uh, for our transmission line. As a government, we cannot be able to do it alone. <coughs> we are looking for to uh, doing a whaling tariff whereby we sign uh, uh, an agreement, a PPP agreement for maybe 20, 25 years, uh, so that we invite the private sector participation. Currently, the, the transmission line is done 100% by the state. But if you can see now, it's very slow. How do we move from the 4,000 kilometers to 10,000? As a government, uh, we cannot do it alone. This is an area whereby private inv investors are welcome uh, to, to work together so that we can achieve our universal <laughs> access of electricity. And also our, uh, our role as a, as, a, as, a, as a country of connecting the east and to the southern and to the northern power force. So that is uh, generally where we are as a country. And uh, of course, we are enjoying uh, political stability. That should have been my first opening remarks. <laughs> but I, I decided <laughs> to make it last. Uh, we are enjoying stability in a region whereby uh, there, are, there are a lot of issues in Kenya for the last 55 years has really enjoyed that stability not only political, also in terms of the economy, in terms of the investment. I think that is the only country whereby we honor our PPS. You'll find that the PPS which was signed, uh, we've been able to meet our obligations without any failure. Uh, so it is a good destination. We are not looking only for, for Kenya alone. We are looking for the whole region and looking for the whole uh, Africa as a whole. And that is a gateway for any investor to come in. So I, I, I had said earlier on that we are really focused on the sustainability of our geothermal fuel. And it is good that we can hear our sister here, Rebecca, the person in charge of the biggest company, uh, which is 70% uh, owned by government and 30% owned by private <coughs> so. Thank you. Thank you, CS Kuchel. I'll discuss briefly about Kenjen, but as we go there, Rebecca Miano lawyer by training of course as you can imagine an engineer by association at times by pretense <laughs> and by practice so kenjen is 70 percent owned by government 30 percent private trading at the nairobi securities exchange we are driven by organic growth we have new equity and incremental debt. And we have an asset base of 3.8 billion USD and annual revenues of about 34 million. Kenya and Kenjen are the ninth global geothermal developer. And we have one of the world's lower cost geothermal uh, fields. We are also also certified in terms of generation mix. Currently, Kenjan is 50% geothermal. We have hydros at 38%, thermal 12%, wind 1%, and that makes us 88% green. A good detail to note. In regard to the geothermal, the 50% that we have, we have about 534 megawatts already installed, comprising of all carrier one, which is 45 megawatts. We have all carrier two, 105 megawatts. We have all carrier four, that's another 140. All carrier one, unit four and five, another 140. 
we have smaller modular units, wellheads, that make up about 85 megawatts. And that in total is about 534. We have some ongoing projects, medium term by the year 2020, and the one under construction of Carrier 5, a whooping 166 megawatts expected on stream July 2019. The other projects for geothermal or carrier one, unit six, it's under contracting, expected to be commissioned in December 2020. We are rehabilitating one of the oldest plants, that is our carrier one, 45 megawatts. We want to do a total rehab and bring it back online by the year 2021. Something special about our carrier one. It was installed 37, 37 years ago, that's when it was commissioned, generating 45 megawatts. Today, 37 years down the line, it generates 45 megawatts. It has done well, but old enough to be rehabilitated. <coughs> and we have other projects, and by 2022, we plan to bring on stream 571 megawatts of geothermal and for wind about 130 megawatts and so the, the wind we have 50 megawatts in our original field of Ngom and we are doing some others in the central part of Kenya called Meru and so and we are also working on partnerships with other developers and the key ones are Akira 140 megawatts. We want to partner with other licensees, also so 70 megawatts. We are also discussing with others for joint development. We are diversifying our strategy, currently offering drilling services locally and in the region. We are also providing geothermal consultancy, also local and regional. Very well. We are working on a proposed energy park where we shall be providing manufacturers and industrialists with steam and energy. We are considering a tourism geothermal spur. We have a small one which we intend <coughs> to upgrade. We are also targeting a bit of manufacturing. We want to manufacture our own drilling detergent and transformers and also mineral extraction. And so our plate is full. We are also keen on innovation and continuous improvement, which is one of the focus areas and a pillar in our strategy. And some of the key innovation areas that we are focusing on is the reservoir optimization techniques and technologies, which fits very well with our trip here. We've learned a lot. We have some takeaways <coughs> that we shall implement, but we go back knowing that we are not very badly off. The other innovation is geothermal mineral ex uh, extraction technologies would like to extract silica, lithium, sulfur, and carbon dioxide. And one of the other innovation imperatives supported by Power Africa was the sustainable community engagement methodologies that we are currently finalizing and we will be we will be able to progress that and implement that. On a leadership level, we are focusing on our people because we know that if we focus on people, everything else, including the strategy, will be taken care of. Specifically in regard to the field, we have a good field. We were able to identify the differences between the field we saw at the geysers and also the cost of field. And so our takeaway is that the kind of field we have in our career, the depletion and the decline is significantly lower than what there is here in the United States uh, and in California. 
And so we appreciate you and value you for being here and being our partners. Thank you very much. Well, in addition to what she has mentioned, we all, uh, geothermal in Kenya, the, the reserve is about 17,000 megawatts. What we have done, what we have done, is only about 600 megawatts in total. So you can see that the potential in it is, is, is huge. And what we have done is uh, to fast track uh, the, that we open the green fields for investors to come and invest. So we've licensed some of the some of the fields uh, apart from licensing uh, a Kenyan. We also have a state-owned uh, company, GDC, currently having drilled uh, a lot of wells and they, 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 they have uh, done concessioning for about one, 105 megawatts, which already uh, we are waiting for implementation. The other fields which have not yet been done, but there are also brown fields which we've already done the infrastructure, the road network, the water and everything, which soon will also give it up for the development. Uh, for, for any investor, because I'd say the focus is, is really on the thermal um, as, as a country because of the, the potential. We're also working with our neighbors in Ethiopia and Djibouti because we fall under the same geological and uh, assisting them in, in some of the areas. So I think basically that is where we, that is Kenya. You're welcome for any question, any comment. Please, if you have any questions, just identify yourself uh, as you're asking, and, and we can have a, uh, a conversation. Um, my name is Hedley Jacobus. I work with Tetra Tech. Um, it, it seems I'm interested in asking about your desire to expand your uh, wind portfolio. And uh, one of the things that I've seen in the past when looking at uh, other countries who um, are wanting to do the same thing, there is a number of barriers. But one that people don't normally talk about is access to tools like forecasting and also sort of institutional knowledge of the technology, not just of the turbines, but also predictive uh, tools for um, generation that uh, stand in the way of widespread or deep penetration. What are the barriers that KenGen foresees um, in uh, the 130 megawatts they plan to put in, and larger, more ambitious numbers. Yes, in, in regard to wind, some of the challenges that we face is just land acquisition. Mostly the land is owned by individuals, so you can imagine the process of negotiating to get adequate land for that. Also being a fairly new technology, though we've had wind 25 megawatts for some time now, we need a lot of capacity building and training and technology. Specifically in Gong, because of the terrain, we've been forced to put up fairly small turbines because of the movement and transportation of the equipment. So that's another challenge. But the area in the central Kenya is quite flat. And we have seen that the proposal will be to put up maybe much bigger turbines that will be more efficient. And so because we have 300 megawatts being commissioned later this year, maybe September, I'm sure that will offer a training ground for our people. We will learn more from that project together with the training that we will undertake. <coughs> the time we do the next project, I'm sure we'll be able to, to surmount and to overcome the challenges. Also, we, I think Power Africa is also assisting us in terms of the grid uh, study. So that, uh, that is one of the biggest barriers which, which inhibits uh, most of the development in, the, in that sector, which I think we are working on it with another with the team so that we can study it very well. Yes. Nick Snow with Oil and Gas Journal. I uh, am impressed with uh, your progress in connecting households. <coughs> I wonder if those households are concentrated largely in Kenya's urban areas or if they include a significant number of rural households. 
and what are the challenges you face in connecting those rural households? Well, uh, Kenya is uh, is uh, has a, its own uh, challenges. Our set our setup is not uh, organized. Uh, largely about um, all these are rural areas. 4.9 million are rural areas. And when I say rural, there, there, there are areas whereby even we don't have the grid. I mean, more largely the northern part going all the way, bordering Ethiopia, Somali. Mm -hmm. uh, those are, we are doing it under the off grid. The World Bank has, has funded us, the government also has funded us, so we are doing hybrid wind and solar. And we are running some of the uh, diesel generators on, on about 23, which we are running across those. So, I mean, the setup is uh, is not is rural. Nearly about uh, about 90 percent is rural. So, of course, the challenges <laughs> is um, uh, in terms of the distance. It's, it's very expensive, and that's why it has been very slow uh, getting the key to those people. They are not if they were in organized settlements, it could be easier to connect them. But the way they are, you'll find a train somewhere, then another 20 kilometers, you'll find another train. So, I mean, in terms of the system loss, in terms of the stability of the network, it is expensive. It is very expensive. But we are managing if you can see the rate, which you have done uh, with all the combination now. Instead of doing the, the, the extension of the grid, we will use we will be using the the solar and the wind. Thank you. Elise Boris with USA. I was wondering if Kenya is planning on exporting some of your electricity to the neighboring countries. I know you were talking about the uh, um, electricity line going to Uganda and then to Rwanda. Um, and I work primarily in Uganda, they're also planning on exporting their energy. So I was wondering where you think it would be best to send your electricity. As a region, we, we of course, that is the, the aim. We are working towards um, interconnect you know, with the electricity between the region. Uh, currently, we've signed a PPA 400 megawatts from the Ethiopia Hydro. That's why we're building the transmission line connecting to China. We have already signed also with Rwanda 30 megawatts. That's why we are doing the transmission line all the way to Kigali. Yeah, they are, each country is doing their part. Uh, Uganda is doing their part. Uh, we are also working to Uganda, Tanzania also. Uh, we are working towards um, Russia and, and Zambia. So of, of course that is the ultimate of either, if we have surplus, give it to another country. If we don't have, we can get. Currently we are buying from Uganda. We are getting almost um, 30 megawatts of Uganda. So we will complement one another. Yes. My name is Alfonso Guzman and I work with Canon and I have two questions. One is um, what is the ministry's um, or Kenjin's view about the role of natural gas in the energy mix, generation mix, and what, if any, plans does the government have to, uh, if, if they intend to use natural gas to import LNG? And the second question is about the uh, PPPs and uh, beyond the current project that is being considered for PPP, uh, Kenjin, the geothermal plant, are there other PPP uh, plans for Kenjin in other geothermal projects or maybe solar or wind uh, projects? Yeah, thank you. On the natural gas, I think I mentioned that we, we are working on a 700 megawatts. <coughs> LNG power currently. Uh, mm -hmm. We should be doing RFPs in the next, maybe within the next two months, so that we can, uh, it has been done, but we never moved forward. So we are working on it so that, uh, I think the problem was gas at that time was very expensive, but with the production of gas, I think from Australia and the other countries coming up, uh, the, you have seen the rate of the gas coming down. We were also, uh, Mozambique, is developing their gas also, which is nearer. Tanzania have their gas, so we are working uh, with, the, with, the, with them so that once the power plant is on stream, the source of getting the gas also is another, because that is a pass through cost. So that, in the next two months, you will be seeing that um, that is a project which is key 
because that is the project which will remove all the 700. Why, why I mentioned 700 is we have about 700 thermal power plants which are run under diesel. We also have some plants run by Kenjen, which are convertible uh, to run under gas. And then even a, a private uh, uh, power plant, Zavo, which also run under diesel. That is, with the, with, the, with the development of the 700 megawatt, we'll be able to convert that. So those are the plants which are there. Of course, uh, the, the second question on PPPs, uh, we are working, Kenjen is also working on a plan on joint <coughs> venture not necessarily developing it alone getting a joint like now they have about uh, 300 megawatts of steam ready ready we are working on any investor can come and we are working on a uh, framework whereby any investor uh, can have a joint venture bring in equity to develop the power plant and already the the, the the steam is there 300 megawatts ready uh, we just drill all the wells and and we've closed them uh, because we don't have money. So we, we have to close them, but right now we need to open up so that their balance sheet also can open up for, for other, in, uh, other use, not necessarily for the development of the power plants as an entity. So we have the plants on LNG, that is uh, of high priority. Yes. Uh, Steve Fountain, Venice Feldman, uh, you had mentioned you're looking uh, for investors to help um, connect the different regions uh, through transmission lines and stuff. Um, can you talk about what risks you foresee for those investors and what Kenya is doing to mitigate those risks or plans to do to mitigate those risks? On Randy, we are, we are not looking for an investor to do the regional interconnect. We would need it done. On Randy funded, the lines are coming to the one of Ethiopia is coming to a completion by uh, by next year. The one for Orkaria also is coming to completion by the, uh, Uganda and Kigali. We should finalize by this 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 financial year. The one going to Zambia through Tanzania, Tanzania already we've done under the East, East African Power So on the regional, we are not. We are only concentrating on the local evacuation from the because it is very easy to have a ppa or a welling tariff within the evacuation from a power plant uh, to the off taker so that is where we are we are concentrating we don't want to get involved in the regional so we want to we can manage the local yes uh, Jaoko. Yes, Are you making a comment or a question? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a question, it's just uh, in reinforcing some of the... I mean, my forte largely is regional power trade, yes. and uh, I just wanted to reinforce the point that uh, the region is preparing for power trade. So we as Power Africa are helping uh, countries in the region who are members of the power pool, uh, 11 of them, um, with uh, establishing a framework for power trade and uh, are the tools that uh, are, I mean, the requisite tools for power trade. Um, I mean, as we speak, uh, we've been helping Kenya, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Tanzania um, develop the wheeling framework and tariff for that power trade. I mean, the country signed bills, but we want to make them happen. Uh, we're also looking forward to helping uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda also with this, I mean, with tools and the requisite framework to be able to realize that deal. Um, and maybe uh, the question from the gentleman, um, outside Kenya, there is a lot of activities. I mean, as you may know, um, Uganda has a surplus, as uh, she, uh, she's mentioning, and it's building up. Um, other Ken Kenya is also building up, Ethiopia is building up. So um, as a region, uh, we are looking at uh, what do we do with this asset, which is surplus power. So um, people don't like studies, but uh, we'll be commissioning a study to look at uh, how do we, one, how do we stimulate demand, and two, how do we trade this power within Eastern Africa and outside Eastern Africa? I mean, interconnecting with the power pools and so on and so forth. Thank you. Yeah, you mentioned uh, some issues about uh, network development. I wonder if you could shed some light uh, on uh, the impacts of the delays in the construction of the Nairobi transmission line to your development plan. Uh, I'm Will Poland with 
QSCA? On, on Nairobi, of course, uh, we had a lot of challenges on the Nairobi ring, but we finished the commission last Wednesday. Okay. We've done it last Wednesday, so well as your president commission. Uh, and that, that the stability of power right now with the condition of the Nairobi ring is now stable. There were challenges in terms of the conductors. Uh, some of the conductors uh, uh, were facing difficulties, financial difficulties. Mostly some of the conductors were from uh, from India, <coughs> dealing with the transmission lines, but right now we, we, we find finalized. I'm happy to say that. Congratulations. Yes, and, the, and our demand has gone up. In fact, for the last, uh, from when has the uh, demand for the first time in the history has gone up because of the stability of that mm -hmm. uh, and the completion of the, the ring. Yeah. And then, of course, there were vandalism uh, all along the, the line. Which, which you have now uh, done with it now. Yes, uh, maybe, let me go, uh, okay, the lady, I think we have not had a lot of ladies. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tracy Matthew with Partnership International, and I have actually two questions. Um, what was the price per kilowatt when you started out, and what is it today? And because of this interconnection between um, the countries, like, for example, Uganda, um, will that impact, in your opinion, what their price per kilowatt will be? Because they'll be starting out fresh, but they won't have that advantage, per se. And then I have another question after that, but I'll let somebody else come. <laughs> okay, our, if you see the interconnect which you have done, the price like from Ethiopia, it's about seven cents per kilowatt. That is the, that is the tariff which you have signed. But if, if you see the tariff... When you see, first started, what was it? Uh, for the interconnect. I'm, I'm starting from the regional, okay. then I'll come to the, 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 the domestic. Okay. So when you, Ethiopia, that is the cheapest, about seven cents. Uganda is about 22 cents. Because we are getting some power supporting the western part of Kenya, it's about 22 cents, which is very expensive. If you see that seven cents. But by and large, if you see our, our average tariff as a, as a country is about nine cents. Nine cents to 10 cents per kilowatt hour. It varies. I mean, hydros are about uh, ranging from two to five cents. So, but the, an average is about five cents. Geothermal, again, is very cheap. It's about seven cents. Some of the power plants are six, depending on the financial model. So, that is the average. Of course, the, the, the wind power plant is about, uh, the 310 is about nine cents. I'm coming to the three. The solar one, the 55, is about five shillings. It's about, it's about not five shillings, it's about five cents. Sorry, I'm using a current. <laughs> so it's about five, 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 five cents. Uh, so it is a combination. What we are doing now uh, as a country is we are, we are trying to work on the cheapest power plants possible. So that any power plant which is coming to the grid, and that's why we are transiting from the, the feeding policy, which was providing for the 12 cents uh, to an auction whereby you can get the best tariff. If you do an auction, I mean, so, so like solar worldwide has come down. I mean, the, the India is doing at about 6.5, about 6 cents. The other countries which are doing 7. But if we maintain our policy of feeding of 12, 12 cents, of course it impacts uh, negatively if we want to sell out to, to another country. But if it is cheap like that, uh, we will be able to, to, to go to the factory. Okay. Hi, Lawrence Jones with Edison Electric Institute. Uh, two, two quick questions. Uh, the, the first one, can you talk a little bit about the uh, harmonization of the market rules within the different Eastern African uh, power pools? I know you talked about Uganda, Kenya, and as the markets evolve, they seem to be having different perspectives on how each market model is going to be used. So can you just talk about, from a, from a national perspective, how you see the harmonization? And then if you expand the conversation to more of a, a pan-African conversation around energy, what are your thoughts as to uh, how we will see the East African power pool connecting to the West African power pool? Uh, because there's a lot of surplus in the East and there's a shortage in the West, right? And so any thoughts on the discussions with the African governments about looking at really creating a, a true pan-African network? Well, uh, um, 
currently what we are doing under the Eastern African Purple is that uh, we, we have not uh, reached the approach of doing um, a standardized in, in, in terms of demonization. That's why you realize that the tariff between ourselves and Uganda is not the same tariff again between ourselves and Rwanda. They, they, they are totally different. It is an entity tariff by rich by country. The one to the Ethiopia, the one which will sign with you, Uganda and, and Tanzania will be totally different. But I think with the completion of the regional interconnection, <coughs> uh, which I had mentioned, uh, we will work as a region to have a standardized tariff so that it is either by versa. If we have a surplus or not, it is a standard. Uh, by having all these power plants on stream. Of course, uh, to the West, I had mentioned earlier on that um, uh, on Ready African Development Bank, I funded a line from Kigali going to DRC, which you see from DRC now to be able uh, to connect to the West Africa. And then from the other side, we are working towards Central Republic of Africa, so that from Uganda, you can also connect uh, through their walking towards the Western West uh, the, the, the Nigeria and the other countries. So there are plans under the AU to see that um, as, as, a, as, a, as a region, uh, we have that network going all the way to South Africa, going all the way to uh, Egypt, and then going all the way to, to Nigeria. So we are building, of course, expanding. That is what you are doing now, expanding to Rwanda, DRC. Then from there also, they, they can also expand to the other uh, neighbors. So there, there, there are high plans because that will assist us. I mean, Europe uh, has done it they are on, on one network, I mean, which, which is very easy. You don't need to develop some of the power plants. If you have a, like um, a hydro, I mean, DRC Congo has a lot of potential. They can, they can develop that uh, power plant. Uganda can develop a lot and then they can supply. We don't need to invest in that. We can invest in, in the transmission and distribution network. Yes, and I think you'll answer that. I'll answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Partnership at International was very involved in carrying out the feasibility study for the Center of Excellence. And we understand that just recently they had their first sort of opening um, in the Basha of uh, the, the Center of Excellence itself. And uh, as we understand from doing the study, there were seven, several million dollars, like I think it was like 10 to 15 million committed by the president to invest into the development of this center of excellence. Is that going to happen, or what is the financial commitment? It's going to happen. Just got approval from the board recently, and the plans are underway to kickstart the process. It will happen. Based in Naivasha. Silence means you are okay. <laughs> Anything, maybe the last question. Hi, uh, Katrine Hinderdahl from USTDA. Um, you've spoken briefly about it, but I was hoping that you could talk a little bit more about what government plans are for bringing on a lot of the, the intermittent renewables, such as Lake Turkana, in a couple months. Um, are there any? Uh, what, what's the thinking around how to how to manage that with the grid? I didn't catch your question. So there's a lot of renewables coming online in the next few months to years. Um, what options is the government looking at to, to manage a lot of that intermittent power coming online? Are there options in terms of looking at storage, pumped hydro, battery, other things? Just wondering. Of course, I think um, there are studies already uh, Kenton are doing on the storage. And um, of course, as a country, uh, we want to remove some of the thermal power plants. I said already we have an installed about 700 megawatts. So we are, we are trying to get the renewables and get other sources of energy by removing some of the thermal power plants, which are very expensive for us to run. So we are working on all that storage. So, and then of course our, our, our grid with hydro and geothermal, that's why our focus is to bring in more geothermal. And then of course to uh, maximize use of the hydro so we are still okay in terms of the stability of the grid in, in getting in renewables. We are still below a third, 30 percent. I mean, the 355, 25. We are still okay. The grid uh, study in Kenya um, is able to, to absorb that. 
we are not yet reached that level of uh, going beyond 30 percent so we are not worried about that and then if you see the power plants she has mentioned 168 megawatts by next year the other power plants coming in we will be able to add more renewables out of that so our stability uh, is sustained Do we have time for one more question? <laughs> David, please. David Stonehill with Power Africa Coordinator's Office. My question is for Ms. Miano. You mentioned that KenGen is working on a sustainable community engagement strategy. Um, for those in the room not familiar with what that is, maybe you can um, just explain a little bit and, um, and talk about why this is a smart business decision for KenGen. Most of our installations and investments and power plants are located within where communities live. And we've had quite a lot of challenges, a lot of issues with dealing with communities. Yet our business model is to enrich the very communities. And so the need to have a harmonious engagement and coexistence <coughs> because of that need we got support from Power Africa and a framework has been developed. We will soon be launching that. And I think by far it's one of the smartest business decisions that has been made. Because in that framework, the communities then become partners. They support the project. And I remember part of the project was actually to have these communities visit other areas in New Zealand and see how it is done. And after that exercise, we just got enough goodwill to take us to the end of the next two projects. And when we implement the framework, it can only get better. So yes, it is a very smart business. Okay, well, thank you all very much. If you'd please uh, join me in, in thanking uh, Cabinet Secretary Qatar and, and Mrs. Miano. It's been a wonderful discussion, and I'd like to thank both of you for uh, putting up with our logistics schedule this week and uh, doing so with a smile on your face and also for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, this has been a wonderful exercise. Again, uh, I'm Andrew, and uh, I hope you have a great uh, weekend. Thank you. Thank you.